What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. It's our second episode. We made it. We made it. Love to hear it. Today, we got a very special guest. But before we get to the special guest, welcome back to your favorite podcast out of Ipsilani, Stay in Power. I am your host, Shane Collins. He, him, his pronouns. And this is my lovely co-host who we missed last week. Hi, guys. I'm Lay. I'm your other co-host. <laughs> and today, y'all, we got... Do I need to say anything? <laughs> we got Franny Choi. Clap it up for Franny Choi. Clap it up for Franny Choi. Hello, hello. So good to be here with y'all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is wild. Um, the first time I saw Franny, well, I heard of Franny um, because Franny has history in the area of which we reside. So <laughs> a very famous name around here. Um, but the first time I saw Franny perform was after the uh, after the slam in Detroit in 2019. Yep. Um, the youth slam? The youth slam. Oh God, that was an amazing show. <laughs> Everybody was so good. Was I like stuff. lost my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was great stuff. Um, saw you and I was like, I don't know. You 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 made it. <laughs> you made it. I feel like I feel like this isn't a a, a a area where I hear a lot of names outside of this area in their famous <laughs> you know what I mean uh so yeah uh, that was well, the, great. the poetry slam or the poetry scene of like Ann Arbor Ipsy Detroit is like legendary you know and so yeah. just to be able to be a part of it for like a few years was like really amazing it was really cool yeah um speaking of that what was your experience with slam poetry? Um, and how does writing for a page compare to writing for a performance? Yeah, you know, this is this is a question that I get a lot as somebody who, who sort of does both, you know, um, who has both published works and also um, uh, in some ways sort of like came of age in a poetry slam and a spoken word community. Um, uh, and I think that my answer to the question has kind of like changed over the years, right? Um, as my own craft and development um, has like progressed and changed over the years. Um, but I guess I think that in the in the past when I was writing specifically, specifically knowing that most people were going to whoever had any contact with the poem were going to hear it and see my body performing it and um, that that was like the main way that people would get it um uh and particularly also when I was like reading poetry in like a competitive way then there's like a certain there's a certain set of limitations right and a certain set of also like things that are valued like a certain set of values so like a limitation being like, you are only going to get to hear this one time, you know, like you can't go back and read it again if you like didn't get a line. Like, so it has to be like accessible from the jump. Um, but like, uh, and, and a set of, well, not but, but like, and a thing that is particularly valued in that space I I found, or like, I think is that um, uh, like, like a sense of kind of, um, of like urgency of the moment right now. Like this is the one story that has to be told. It has to be told right now. I have to get it out as fast as I can. Another value in that space is like, um, is what I think of often as virtuosity. Like 
look like I'm a virtuoso, you know, like the mm-hmm. same way that you can be like a violin virtuoso. If, if you're on that stage, you have to be, you have to like, the, the point is to say like, I am a poetry virtuoso. Like I can say, I can use the most complex metaphors. I can say it the fastest. I can control my breath, you know, like the best I can, I can get all the way to the end of the line and keep you hanging right there. Um, and so I think that once I kind of, that, so like th- these were some of the things I was thinking both about the sort of like limit limitations and the sort of values of that space. And then on the page, like there are also limitations and values. There are also tools, like certain tools, like rhythm and sound that some that overlap and some that are like really specific to that. Right. And so like, I mean, urgency, I think is also kind of valued on in like on the page, right? Like you want to keep your reader reading, you know, like you want to keep them interested and excited but you can't just, you can't make a poem urgent by reading it fast. And so how do you keep the tension high? Like there's a lot of other things that you can do. You can use line breaks. You can, um, you can make one really long sentence with really complicated syntax so that they have, they like are guessing like, when is it going to land? When is it going to land? When is it going to land? Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, I guess I, I sort of now these days, I, I used to think of poetry slam as like, a very, or like performance poetry as like one kind of poetry that I wrote and page poetry as a different kind of poetry that I write. And now I think that they overlap a lot, but I'm still mm-hmm. really interested in the differences between like what happens to a poem in the air and what happens to a poem on the page. Yeah. yeah um, so I have a question. So mm-hmm. when you when you're writing for a stage performance, I got a couple questions. When you're writing for a stage performance, does your language, like if you were somewhat writing the same piece for um, performance versus just a page, does your language kind of switch to uh, use more theatric uh, type language in a performance set? I mean, theatric language, that's interesting. I, th- I think, I think so. There are certain things, I mean, we, there are certain kinds of, there's certain kinds of language that pops on it, on the stage that doesn't exactly pop on the page. You know what I mean? Or like it pops in a different way. Maybe mm-hmm. like, like sound and like really subtle rhyme or something. Yeah. Like that's the kind of thing that like a sort of like subtle slant rhyme that's like, internal and not like you know not necessarily like super you know like end rhymes like re- coming at really predictable times um like if you say if you get to like the heart of your poem like that one line that is really important and that line happens to just subtly rhyme with the line before like you know that's a line that people are going to be like oh you know what i mean <laughs> right um yeah for sure but there are things that you you know like and like you can have that kind of effect and still do it on the page. You're just going to use different tools to get there. You know, like you might use spacing to get there or like you might you might like have ha- have had every line be like in jammed. So have the line continue the sentence continue past the end of the line um, and onto the next line. Right. But then have that one line that like really has to hit. Make sure that that line ends in a period. You know, like mm-hmm. it's like subtle things like that that you can also do to to get that same effect going on the page. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's dope. <laughs> um, a sort of personal question. Well, I, I suppose you kind <laughs> of answered it. Um, but uh, as far as line breaks go on a page. Because something you brought up about keeping kind of the same urgency in a performance that you would on a page. Um, but uh, it, I, and I guess it's just on how the person reads it mm-hmm. uh, and takes that piece. But um, is there any is there any particular method that comes to mind when using just different ways to format the, the words? Um, or is it just whatever feels right? Mm. Yeah. You know, I think that with with all poetry, <laughs> I feel really nervous about saying, starting any sentence with, with all poetry, <laughs> comma. But 
and but I might even say with all art oh no that's scary but I think I think that one of the most important things one of the most fundamental things is creating expectations and then breaking expectations right like creating a pattern Mm -hmm. and then breaking a pattern and so I think that's why like if you have so I guess what I what I would say is that like when thinking about the visual arrangement of words on a page, I wouldn't think of it as just necessarily just do whatever your heart tells you, because that could be really cool. But also, um, I think that it's it can be really helpful to have some rules that you then break. So like every line is a full sentence. And then suddenly then what happens if two thirds of the way through you, those sentences start getting fragmented or something like so there's no spa- weird spacing and then suddenly there's weird spacing then it makes something in your brain click right so um that's why I think like a sonnets that's one of the things I think that are so appealing about sonnets is because they're so if they're little poems and they have so many rules but you can break them so easily and make like little changes to 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 like break up the pattern this little tiny room um yeah, so I think that my my um, advice to anybody who's trying to think about how to how to arrange poems on a, a on a, on the page would be to to set up a few rules for yourself, even if they're ar- arbitrary, and then at one point break one. Yeah. Oh, Shane, I think you're muted. I am. I am. I, I just talk a lot, even when I, I it wasn't directly. Anyways, uh, Lay, please. <laughs> I really like what you said about like making your own rules and breaking them. Cause literally a lot of the times the same part, they're like, okay, we're about to do this prompt. And then they're like, okay, did everybody write to the prompt? I'm like, I did not. <laughs> I wrote something like completely off the page. So I love what you said about that. Um, during like podcasts and stuff, do you ever get a lot of podcast anxiety? Because I know that's a big thing for me, especially right now, because I'm very nervous in front of you, because also I look up to you, but yeah. Oh my God. Well, I I mean, first of all, I'll just say like, everybody's doing great. <laughs> and this is really fun. And it's just like, I mean, it's tr- truly just like a pleasure to get to talk to, to talk to y'all, like talented young folks who are like, spending their time doing meaningful shit making art that like will change things and like make meaningful spaces in the world like that I don't know it's like this is like you're like y'all are literally like the coolest and best demographic of person to get to talk to so like not even yeah please please um but I yeah I mean podcast anxiety 100% I get super nervous I get super nervous about talking to any anyone just in the world but especially like um yeah poets that I admire artists that I admire when we have to when we interview them like um yeah but also I think that it's it, so over this past season of verses so verses is, is the podcast that I host um with my friend um the poet Dana Smith and we've been doing it for about five years now. And um, over this past year, because of the pandemic, um, we have been doing all, you know, all of it over Zoom, like we're doing now. And um, when we normally record our podcast in Chicago, except for like a few times a year when we'll like go to other places like festivals, conferences or whatever, and then just like get to talk to the poets who are there. Um, But because we've been doing it over Zoom, we've we've just had our pick of like any poet that has an, has like a Wi-Fi connection, right? Like we're not like limited to just like who's going to be there. And so what that's kind of meant is that we've ended up talking to some people who are like much more um, like famous <laughs> than, than like uh, some of our previous guests. Um, like right. Naomi Shihab Nye, for example, was one of our guests in the last season, who's just like a, a legend with like 20,000 books. Um, and right what has been really um, amazing about that is learning that uh, all of these people that whose work I admire so much are literally just people with living rooms. You know what I mean? Like they're just like people with living rooms and like a cat sleeping in the background and like who need to like get up and like um, get like get juice. <laughs> like, and so I think that that right. 
and, and they're like nice the people are like really kind and so I think like it's just been like remembering that everyone is actually like most people are nervous about doing this kind of thing it helps me to be like okay like if Carl Phillips can like nervously adjust his ring light because he's you know uh, like excited and uh, anxious about talking to us then like it's okay for me to like have some nerves and like will everybody everybody makes like everything all of the best art and all of the best podcasts in the world have been made by people who were nervous about oh who were think nervously thinking like oh my god is this gonna go well and like yeah often it just goes well and that's okay I love that <laughs> also I also love that answer because I know a lot of the times I get again I get nervous whenever I do podcasts so just hearing you say like you just got to realize these are just people with living room. It keeps it, it's like, I think the idolization of people kind of makes us nervous because it's like, oh my gosh, this is my role model. But again, this is just a person. We're just talking to them. Um, also, speaking of your versus podcast, how did that come to be with you and Dan? And- yeah, so Denez and I, the, the way that that happened was that um, Denez and I had been kind of each individually thinking about audio and podcasts and like wanting to do something in that medium um I think this was like maybe this is 2015 when we were talking and they um they were really interested in podcasting I was like I was starting to think about I had just recorded an audio book for my first book and so I was like oh like this is a really cool um this is a really cool medium like to be able to kind of like not just read poems at readings or um have poems reach people through like the page but also but by like whispering in their ear like that's such a cool way to get poems to people um there's so many things you can do and so we were to sort of you know we'd like kind of like casually mentioned it we're in a collective together the dark noise collective we've been um it's a group of six artists that have been working together pretty closely for like 10 years. Um, and like at one of our retreats, we like both kind of like mentioned it to each other. And then a little while later, the Poetry Foundation and approached Denez um, about wanting to start this podcast. And I think that they were trying to like appeal to a slightly wider audience um, than just like the people who would go to like poetryfoundation.org and like search for podcasts Um uh, to, to down, you know, like they were trying to like reach, I don't know. I think that they were trying to like get to like young people of color actually. Um, and so we were like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll be fun. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah. And so then we realized that the thing that we wanted to do most was, um, interview poets and also to have the kinds of conversations, like to record the kinds of conversations that poets have, like, not necessarily when they're like being interviewed or like when they're like giving a lecture or or something but like the kinds of conversations that you have like like it's a dialogue yeah you know what i mean like it's like it's not like today we're gonna talk about uh syntax yeah you know what i'm saying yeah i feel that right but like how do poets look at the world like what kinds of jokes do poets make and like Ooh. I think that you know, like we, but like we love, like we come from a community of, like we come from a lifetime of, um, of like great conversations with very brilliant people who look at the world in weird ways, you know, yes. and so that was like we were like let's let's try to see if we can bring that to to people. So that's kind of like what we were. That was sort of our our thing, yeah. Because y'all know that like, you know, like artists, like artists say <laughs> amazing, amazing stuff all the time. No, and uh, sure. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, you know, I think I think a lot of people who are not uh, too, too hip to the poetry scene, you know, especially the spoken word poetry, uh, mm-hmm. it's got a got a bit of a bad rep. Um, totally. Totally. Right. You know, like. Like if you, yeah, like, like will, you know, boring, like you'll fall asleep. Maybe yeah. there'll be some snaps in the audience. And Everybody like, like a, just like a simultaneous, like they're robots, just yeah. nice job. Like, right, right, right. 
I was like, after 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 I suppose becoming a poet, I'm like, hey man, you kind of kind of kind of disrespectful right now. It's 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 nice over here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's nice over here. It is. It's a lot of great things over here. Um, yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. That, that's so cool though. Um, so. Yeah. Before, before I, I guess now, and and this is a, a pretty dope guy. This is kind of the idea we had as well, you know, um, because we aren't, you know, in a place where we can really meet with a lot of people. Um, hopefully, we're slowly approaching that point. But you know, this is really great because we're kind of only limited to who we decide to reach out to. And if, of course, if they decide to reach back, but, um, you know, before we, you know, it's not like we can fly people out or, you know, right. host them uh, uh, in this area or something. So it is a really, really cool opportunity to be able to virtually, I mean, be able to talk to anybody that's within texting range, <laughs> anyone. So. Um, yeah, I think that this is a good reminder for artists everywhere is like that limitations can lead to like actually great expansiveness if mm. used right yeah yeah absolutely it's a it's a new perspective um so what is the significance of questioning in your work um, and then is there a difference in the role of questioning when hosting the podcast versus uh, using questions in your own pieces? Yeah, thanks for this question. This is an awesome question. Um, I think about questions a lot. I I think, um, well, I guess maybe I'll talk about the about podcasting and interviewing first. Um, because I think that... Um, there's like two different kinds of questions that I find to be really useful in that space. One being like, um, uh, like the way that you might sort of um, help kind of facilitate a conversation at like a party or something between some people who don't know each other that well, you know? So like mm -hmm. if a topic comes up and then you know, like, oh wait, my friend, <laughs> Sam has a really good story about that, then you might be like, you, like, you know, kind of what the answer is, but you say like, wait, Sam, didn't that same thing happen to you? And then he gets to tell his, his like great story. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's like that kind of question, um, which is, which can be really, so it might be like, oh, well you really like do this really interesting, unique thing with metaphor. Like, you know, that makes me think of this. Like, can you talk, can you talk about that? Um, and so like, you kind of just like set people up to tell their great stories. Um, and then there's like the questions that come up in the middle of conversation that you walk, you didn't walk into thinking that you would be asking, you know, <laughs> like, like they bring up something about basketball that like is, is unlike anything you've ever heard anyone say about basketball. And so mm. then you, that leads you to a question that you've never actually even considered and so then you ask that question and then you, and then you get to see in real time this person be like oh wow I didn't think of it that way like let me try to figure out how to answer this question that I've never heard before and like some real magic happens in those moments you know like I yeah think it's, for sure. yeah like I think it's important as an interviewer to kind of keep your eye out for both of those like how can I set up this person to succeed and also like what's the thing that is maybe happening in this conversation that like has never happened before, you know, like what's this, what's like, like, let me just like actually stay super present to what's going on so that I can um, ask that right question at that right time. I think in poems, um, I think kind of similarly, I guess, you know, there's like some of those, some of like those um, kind of like rhetorical questions that are just like super impactful still, like, you know, and isn't it, isn't it the same thing that, you know, like, well, what's the difference really between my, my heart and a whale, a whale or whatever, you know, like these kinds of like rhetorical questions that just like set up an understanding. Um, and then 
And then there's those like much spookier things where you ask something not to make a point, but actually to ask like, no, like what, I don't know the answer to this. Like here is like a real mystery. Um, And I think once again, those are discoveries I find. Like I find that those questions, those spooky, spooky questions are the ones that I, that are, that like burn brightest when I, discover them like actively and organically in the process of writing you know and in order to do that you just I just have to stay I can't plan ahead like I have to just like stay present and like be open to what comes up you know okay so with those spooky questions because I I get a lot of spooky questions nowadays Uh, (laughs) and it's it's overwhelming um, it's you. really overwhelming, uh, you know, when it's, when it's stuff that kind of um, beyond words, so it's it's not really tangible. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 there, but you kind of feel powerless to have control over it. Um, and so, I guess, how do you how do you handle those ideas? And um, as a writer, I guess, you know do you are you somebody that just like this is gonna fuel my writing or does do you like take a lot of breaks in between I, mm-hmm. yeah I guess how does how does your how does writing work for you would you just jump into it are you a person that takes a lot of time in between uh pieces yeah I mean I I think I have a long fermentation period as a writer you know like I it takes it takes a a while for things to settle into um something like language I think yeah I think that like a you know I I think sometimes my best like I could write an okay poem about something that happens to me today but like I think that for me as a poet not everybody is like this but for me as a poet I'll write a much better poem about the thing that happened today like in six months because it, it'll have like sunk into my life and like really kind of, yeah, fermented, I think. Um, but yeah, with the with those like really tough questions that you really don't know the, I mean, those are like the scariest poems for me to write for <laughs> sure, you know? Like it's so much more, like I love writing the poem where I know all the answers. Like I know I'm right also. The, yeah. the poem where I know I'm right is like I mean, it's just like getting oh, to wow. dunk on like an imaginary audience you're like ha, yeah. like I have the answer but um and that's like that's that's fine but I think that actually ultimate uh, like the the poem where I'm like I don't know if I'm right I don't know if I actually have the right answer here like I might be wrong but I'm gonna like try something those are definitely the scariest poems but but like how how else do new thoughts happen? Then yeah. like if you just if you just say like this the stuff that you hundred percent know to be true and right, like all the time in your poems, then like how are you gonna have a new thought? You know, like you have to try out stuff. So that's what I tell myself to try to comfort myself <laughs> when I'm in that place, but it's hard. Yeah, no, for sure. Um how do you I guess it, uh, how much how much concern, um, if any, or how much like stress is it to go into a piece like that or a thought like that, not knowing when or where you'll come out at um, after tackling it? Yeah, man, that's stressful. <laughs> it's really stressful. Um yeah, I mean, I think that this was like, this is one of the things that came up in, there's a poem that I have that comes toward the end of my um, my book, Soft Science, that's called Introduction to Quantum Theory. And it's a poem where I, I'd been thinking a lot about like alternate universes and, um, you know, like thinking about like, oh, in another, in, in another version of the story, in another universe, like this terrible thing in my life is not true, like never happened. And so like, how would my life be different? You know, or like if, if, if there's like a version where like X, Y, Z injustices are happening, 
then like surely there's like an alternate version of the universe where those injustices are not happening like you know like police have been abolished prisons have been abolished etc you know and like I was I was really into that thought and then and then I kind of like in the process of writing this poem, realize like, wait, there are also alternate universes. If there are th alternate universes where like timelines were that are much better, then that also means that there are timelines that are much worse. Mm -hmm. And like timelines that are like, unlike anything that I, I could even just like, as a human being imagine, like that I don't, I don't have the capability of imagining. Um, and then that sent me into like, a, some weird places but I was like but like that is actually that's the new thought that I'm having and so I like had to ch try to chase that even for a little while mm -hmm. um and that didn't lead me to any conclusions and I think that's kind of scary um but in the process of writing that poem I started to to learn to ask a different kind of question which is like the kind of question that you just sort of like let like hold in your mind as a question to 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 work out and not necessarily try to get to it to like an answer but just like hold the question and I think that that like was helpful for my writing um even if it didn't lead me to anything neat I don't know how how about y'all do you do you guys like tend to what's the roles of questions in or like the unknown in in your writing Ladies, you want to start? You can start, please. Um, actually, can you repeat that question so I can like give you a better answer? I'm sorry. Yeah, just like what's the role of like how do y'all think about like knowing versus unknowing in your in your in your own writing in your own writing practice? Like, do you? Yeah, I guess like do you always kind of like know the answer? like in your poems or like, do you think that you write the kinds of poems that ask more questions or the kinds of poems that ask more answers or that, that give more answers maybe? Mm, I think at least for me, I probably write the poems that give more answers um, because I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Actually, I'm gonna like shingle first so I can get a little more time to think about this because yeah. I want to give you a good interpretation. For sure. So Initially, I, I I get a lot of fear around um, even starting a piece. Um, like if if I kind of don't have a structure in mind before I go in, I don't really have any words or anything. But if I'm like, I know I have a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. Finding the middle is is it's 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 tough, but it's I feel more confident going into writing or something. Um, but I get I have a lot of fear around just like starting and not being able to I, I get to a line and I'm I'm just like I'm 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 stuck there. Um yeah. And I think I also write more um pieces that give more answers, like they're kind of more definitive. Um there's a I think I write a lot of pieces kind of like a story. Mm -hmm. So there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and I think that's just where I, I think that's a combination of uh, just my background in theater mm -hmm. um, and then in rap. Um, but then um, also that's just what feels kind of comfortable with me right now. I'm not like at a point where I'm like writing things or writing more conceptual type pieces as opposed to um, um, I want to say something type pieces. I mean, that's super real. That is super real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially I think like if you're, if you're somebody who has been say misunderstood or misrepresented mm. or you know, if there's been like a story that's been told about you that's not true to your life, like, like, I don't know why, why like give more opportunities to poke holes or something, you know, like why not, why not take the opportunity to, to set a record straight or tell a story, you know, yeah. like that, that's like, I 100% feel that 
Yeah. Yeah. Lay, what about you? Um, so I know at least for me, I want to say a lot of my poems have more answers than like the unknown because um, every time it's saying part of my poems or at least famous to me for imagery, I provide a lot of imagery. Like I take you on a story. So I make sure when I write a poem, I want you to feel like you're in the moment with me mm. a lot of the times. And also, at least for when I'm writing poems, sometimes I'll stick to a structure, but then sometimes I hear a word from a poem and then that just sends me off into a spiral into a 10 minute poem where I'm just typing. And then all of a sudden I have like five paragraphs of a mm-hmm. random poem that I just wrote to get here. Um, but yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, I also, I want to say like, I have been writing I've been thinking a lot about questions in my poems but like it takes a lot of work to get to even just like having one genuine question in a poem like one genuine unknown in a poem you know like um yeah it is not it's it's like even having like a little bit of mystery in there I feel like for me is helpful um and it takes a lot of work to get there as as a younger as a younger poet, do you think you wrote more poetry that had answers in it uh, or more questions? Definitely poems that had more answers. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, yeah. I mean, I think that this was it was part of like it was it was it was sort of like I I was like life is short. <laughs> like I might never get mm-hmm. a chance to read a poem to you again. Like and like I. And also like at that point, I had never, I hadn't heard or read very many poems about my experience, like about what even it meant to be an Asian American woman Mm. um, or a queer Asian American person. And so I was like, it, you know, like if it's just me, I mean, it wasn't just me, (laughs) those things like it had never, it had never been just me. But at the time when, if I, when I was like, if it's just me, then like, I have to, I have to say it right. Like I have to make sure that I'm telling the story right. Um, like the, I, I can't leave any room for doubt, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And also like, like things are urgent. People are dying. Like people are being fetishized and murdered and abused and imprisoned and deported and, 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 and. So I was like, I, I, you have, I have to just make sure that I'm, I'm standing 100% by everything that I say, because there's no time to say anything else. There's no time mm-hmm. for doubt. Um, and I still think in some ways that there's no time (laughs) that things are very urgent. Um, I also think that I have understood myself to be a little bit more in community with a larger group of people that some people, like I trust that there are some people who are, who are making the kind of art that tells something like my story, like some part of it, you know, like, um, I trust that there are people who are who are poets and activists and who are making, who, who are, who are writing those poems that are really galvanizing um, people to take action like today. And I, because I know that, and because I trust that, then I don't feel like I am the only one that has to do it. And so it allows me to say like, okay, like what are the very specific things that actually only I can say? And that mm-hmm. isn't, it's not, I'm not the only one that can say what it's like to be an Asian American woman, but I am the only one who can say what it w- was, what it's like to have the mother that I have, have the childhood that I have, have, you know, be living in this city, in this, sitting in this chair, right? And so I think that l- allows me to be like, okay, I can get a little bit weird. I can make, I can make a little bit more room um, for like the weird idiosyncrasies of, of my own life. Um, and that's like, that's a, that's a blessing that is only possible because of a strong community of other writers who are doing amazing work. Wow. That's empowering. That (laughs) feels good. Yeah. That's that's good to me. (laughs) I feel that's good to me. For sure. (laughs) Um, It's just like, you don't gotta feel like you're taking on the world as a writer, um, especially as a, a, a person of color. You don't, you don't gotta like, be like, it's me and I got to ride against and I got to have a message and I got to let people know that everything's got to be so like so 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 important and so impactful and, and that feels good to know that there's a community of others that are doing the same work so collectively you guys can hold that burden 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the the po- the writer Viet Thanh Nguyen talks about this concept of narrative narrative plentitude versus narrative mm-hmm. scarcity. So, like, I mean, he's talking about it specifically when it comes to Asian American fiction, but I think that we can mm-hmm. apply this concept to lots of other kinds of storytelling and lots of other kinds of communities right like if there is a scarcity of stories about us then we're limited in what we can do because the stakes are really high and so like Mm -hmm. having more and more abundance of stories allows us to be able to to do more things as artists collectively yeah um, you're dropping quotes. I, I want to let you know that you're <laughs> dropping quotes. Um, I'm, I'm taking notes. And I would like to just keep it rolling and open up the space for you to share a piece with us. Sure. Yeah, I would I would be happy to. Um, I think that I'll go ahead and I'll read that poem. Um, the poem that I was that I mentioned earlier, Introduction to Quantum Theory. Let me just grab it. Love it. Love it. So excited. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me um yeah it's been so it's been so good to have this conversation and to talk to you both um this poem is called introduction to quantum theory there are only so many parallel universes that concern us in one he isn't dead in another you drink light with your hands all winter There is a universe in which no one is lying emptied in the street as the gas station burns. A universe in which our mothers never learned to wrap their bones in each small grief they found. There is a universe in which there is no difference between the past and the ground. Another where the oceans pull the moon and so on. This is an incomplete list. It has been abridged for your comfort. I could tell you about the many universes in which bad things happen to people other than the people you love. Yes, in another life, it's someone else's sister who climbs to the roof that night. In another life, the boys rise darkly from the asphalt to choke the engines of cruisers, and no one gives birth chained to a hospital bed, and no one's child washes up blue ashore. Sure, you can have these worlds. You can warm them in your hands at night, but know that by signing, you agree also to be responsible for the universe where the oceans glow red, the universe where what we call shadow is pulsing with the musk of hooves, and especially the one in which humans do exist, but only in the nightmares of small children. Will you hold that one too? The version of the story that never learned to consider sound? and the one where sound is only the opposite of metal, and the one where the sound of metal is never enough to quiet the dead. Thanks, y'all. Wow, just just wow. Wow, I'm in awe, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was amazing. Thanks, guys. Um, I, didn't, wow. I didn't know wasn't enough. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it, I, it, I didn't feel like it was going to end. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, I don't know. You just, you're, you're it was very immersed. Um, your words are just very immersive. Um, and it's, 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 it's just really crazy that we're sharing a space with you right now. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it's it's kind of setting in. Um, and truly, so, truly, the pleasure is all mine. The pleasure and the honor um, is is one hundred percent mine. Seriously. Yeah. yeah well, you know, I, I say, you know, you know, I, I like my name. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure, Lay likes their name. Uh, but your name is Franny Choi. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, I know you out here, Franny Choi. And before uh, it sets in any more, and I get any more nervous with myself, um, I think. <laughs> I want to let y'all know um, that we're so happy that y'all showed up. Thank you so much to Franny Choi. Clap it up one more time. Clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. Um, thank y'all for coming. 
Franny, if you would like to say where they can reach you, um, where if you have anything coming up, if you have any websites you would like to link, we can link them all in the description. Um, when we get to the editing process. <laughs> um, Love that editing process. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't do it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's out of the... Uh... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thank you. Um, I My website is www.frannyshore.com. Franny is spelled with a Y. Yeah. Choi is spelled C-H-O-I. Um, and also you can... Um, uh, you can follow, oh, um, Versus, if you're interested in listening to Versus, um, the podcast that I co-host with Denise Smith, that you can um, just type in VS and search for us on wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter at VS the podcast. Um, also, uh, if you're interested in the small organization, small initiative that I've been running um, for the past few years to get readers and writers of poetry to um, help build social justice movements. Um, you can go to brewandforge.com um, and read about our work there. Thank you so much again, again, again. I don't know how many times I can say it, but y'all, this is the second episode this is the second episode so if y'all think this is good keep watching it only <laughs> here it is better it only gets better this is your favorite podcast coming out of ipsilani we are stay in power i am one of your hosts shane collins and i'm your other host lay pasha <laughs> And we're going to sign out. Thank y'all for showing up. Thank y'all for watching. Share with your fam friendly. And we're going to see y'all later. <laughs> Peace. Thank y'all.